So look with me now, verse number one through verse number four. These verses show us the work of Christ. And verse 5 through verse number 12 show us our part. Look with me at verse number 5. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 5 it says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue what? Knowledge. Let's focus on this three first steps on the ladder of salvation. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue what? Knowledge. These are the first three steps. Talk to me now. What is faith? Because faith is this first step. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for. Amen. The evidence of things uh, not seen. Faith, something we are hoping for. And what is the primary thing that we should all be hoping for? Salvation. We can say hoping for the second coming of Christ, but if we are unconverted, we will not see his face in peace. So the Bible is telling us and telling me, if we are going to be saved, we must take this first step on the ladder of salvation, which is uh, faith, the substance of things uh, hoped for. I must be hoping for salvation, salvation from sin, victory over sin. Is that your hope also? Talk to me. Is that your hope also? All right. And notice now, when I look at this first step, which is faith, which is uh, hoping for victory over sin, hoping for salvation, salvation from sin, this desire has to be a gift. Why? Because naturally, I do not want to get victory over sin. Naturally, we do not want to come to Christ. When Adam and Eve sinned and they heard the voice of Christ coming, in the garden, in the cool of the day, what did Adam and Eve do? They hid themselves. They ran away. So naturally, because we're all born in sin and shaped in iniquity, this desire to be saved from sin, this desire to get victory over sin, it is a gift and faith is that gift. That desire to be saved from sin, if that's clear, my friends, say amen. So once I have a desire to get victory over sin, and I make the right choice, the Bible tells me Christ will empower my choice. Who would do it, friends? Yes. So if we desire to get victory over sin and we make right choices, will Christ empower your choice? Yes. So will you also have victory over sin? And notice now, add to your faith what? Virtue. And what is virtue? Power. That word virtue also means valor, V-A-L-O-R. And what does valor mean? It means courage, courage in a battle. So once we accept Christ, once we realize our need, and we say, dear God, I want victory over sin, and by his grace, make the right choice. Then he says, I will empower your choice, give you victory over sin, and then Christ says, I will give you virtue. And virtue, it is valor, it is courage, it is strength in a battle. I am going through many battles, within and without. Are you going through battles? So what do we all need? We need virtue. And to virtue, what must we add? What must we add? We must add knowledge. Both faith and virtue and knowledge, all three are gifts from God. Look with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Where are we going to? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, I know you're all hungry because we skipped Sabbath school this morning. Because of the power outage. So I know you're all hungry now, right? Amen. Hungry for God's word. Would you say amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 8 shows us, as we add to our faith virtue, and all these blessings come from God, add also knowledge. Knowledge is a gift. Verse number 8, are we there? It says, let's read that together, what it says. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of what? Knowledge. By the same Spirit. So is this knowledge a gift from God? And the Bible shows me that there is a condition for me to receive this knowledge, this knowledge which is the third step on the ladder of salvation. And what is this condition? The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So once I fear God, then I can begin to take the third step on the ladder of salvation. How many of you want to climb that ladder? 
All right, friends. And the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Let's read that. Turn, turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1. Where are we going to, my friends? Proverbs chapter 1. Oh, friends, this message is so sweet. You'll see. Proverbs chapter 1. Are we there, friends? Look at verse number 7 with me. Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. And I said, Lord, I want this knowledge. I want to take that third step on the ladder of salvation. Then what does it mean to fear you? For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, what does that mean, the fear of the Lord? Who knows? What does it mean to fear God? To fear God means to hate evil. Look with me at Proverbs chapter 8. Where are we going to, friends? Proverbs chapter 8 and verse number 13. So God is saying to me, Andrew, if you want to take that third step on the ladder of salvation, you must fear me. And this fearing of God means that we must hate sin. And naturally, look with me now, naturally, we are all born in sin, so we do not hate sin. So nobody is born with the fear of the Lord. This is also a gift, and I want it. How about you? Amen. Proverbs chapter 8, verse number 13. It says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. Close your Bible in Proverbs. Let's turn to Psalm 34. Let me give you one more scripture the Lord shared with me. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And what is it? It is pride. And all of us are born with this pride. So we are all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. It is arrogancy. And by nature, we are all arrogant. I see my need, friends. For if I don't fear God and hate pride, arrogancy, and filthy communications coming out of my mouth, I can never receive knowledge, which is the third step on that ladder. So if I don't see my need to have a new heart, to get victory over pride, victory over arrogancy, even over filthy communication out of my mouth, I will never see Jesus Christ's face in peace. Do you want to meet him in peace? So what is God saying to you? What do you need? The fear of the Lord, which means what? To hate evil. Look with me. Do you see your need now, friends? All right. Psalm 34, are we there? Look with me at verse number 11. It says, come, you children, hearken unto me. Let's read now. I will teach you what? The fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of what? Knowledge. And what is that third step on the ladder of salvation? Knowledge. Verse number 12. What is the fear of the Lord? Verse 12. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. I wish I could pause there. And talking about the 144,000 who have no guile in their mouth. So the 144,000, they must fear God. And they are on the third step of the ladder of salvation. And first God is saying, I must get victory over evil speaking. And listen, not only that God showed me, I must also get victory over evil thoughts. Why? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mind, the mouth speaks. And naturally, I think evil. Naturally, I speak evil as things. And all of us are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Today, we must all see our need. It's a gift from God. And once we see our need, come to Christ. He will impart the blessing. Verse number 14 now says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it the fear of the lord is what the beginning of knowledge the fear of god and what does it mean to fear god again friends talk to me to hate, to hate evil and the lord showed me something that really caused me to fall on my knees and as i was brought to the account in the book of genesis talk to me now what did satan 
tempt Eve to partake of in the garden? The fruit of the tree, and the tree was called what? Talk to me. The tree of the knowledge of what? Of good and evil. Do you see it now, friends? The counterfeit. God has a true platform. Third step on the ladder called knowledge. And Satan caused Eve to partake of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what is the fear of the Lord? To hate evil. But Satan tempted Eve and Eve now was brought to a point to love evil. Oh, friends, you're not hearing me. That means, at that very point, did Eve still fear God? No. Because the fear of God is to hate evil. But she partook of that fruit, of that tree, of knowledge of good and evil. That means Eve fell off the ladder and fell on her face. Can you see her by faith? And as she gave to Adam, talking about negative sinful influence, as she gave unto Adam... What did Adam do also? He partook of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. At that point, did Adam still fear God? So Adam fell off the ladder and fell flat on his face. They both sinned. Oh, friends. What God is showing me is Satan could get Adam and Eve to sin while they were created. Perfect how much more power does he have over us who are born oh, friends, in sin and shaped in iniquity? And I said, Lord, does this mean there is no hope for me? And he said, no, Andrew. The point is not were you born in sin or were you born perfect like Adam and Eve. The real point is your choice. Your what, friends? Your choice. Because Jesus, who, friends? Jesus, he took part of our sinful nature. Ah, oh, friends, do you see it now? And yet, did Christ overcome sin? Yes, he did. By what? His choice. And as he chose to do what was right, his father empowered every choice. And God is saying, Andrew, there is hope for you. What is he also saying to you right now? There is hope. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And what is that third step on the ladder of salvation? It is called knowledge. I want to walk up to meet my Savior. How about you, my friends? And since Adam and Eve fell, God is saying you need to watch out. What is God saying to you also? Go back to Proverbs chapter 2 with me. Where are we going to? Proverbs 2, I said, Lord, how then can I receive this knowledge? How then may I walk on this third step of the ladder of salvation? And God said to me clearly, he said, you have to cry out for it. You have to seek it as if it is hidden treasure. Look with me at Proverbs chapter 2. Are we there, friends? Have you ever longed for something? And as we would say, by the hook or by the crook, I have to get it. Have you ever seen some children? They want something and they want it so badly that they begin to want, cry for it. And so it is. If I long for salvation, if I want to walk on that step of salvation, the Bible says I must have godly tears for it. What is God also saying to you? Proverbs chapter 2, are we there, friends? Verse number 3 says, Yea, if thou want, do you see it now? Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou do what now? Ah, if you ask for it, if you seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand what, friends? The fear of the Lord and find what? Ah, the knowledge of God. And verse number six says, For the Lord does what? Giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh what? Knowledge and understanding. So I must cry for it. I must cry out for salvation. Oh, friends, like Peter, 
as Peter took his eyes off Jesus, as Peter began to sink in that water, what did Peter do? He cried out, Lord, save I perish. Let God save him. Let God save you. But you have to cry out for this knowledge. Lord, I want to walk on these steps to salvation. You have to seek for it as for hidden treasures. Then God will give it. So if we ask, we shall receive. Would you say amen? amen. And if we seek, what is the promise? We shall what? We shall find. And God showed me now. That, that third step on the ladder of salvation, which is knowledge, that knowledge is not precious truth. That knowledge is present truth. You all got that? That's why it's a third step. You would think the first step would just be knowledge. Yes, but that third step, it is not surface knowledge, friends. It is deep Bible truth. That, that's the third step of on the ladder of salvation. This is the Bible truth. Hold your place in Proverbs chapter 2. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 28. Where are we going to? Isaiah chapter 28, Father in heaven, help us to understand this third step on the ladder of salvation, namely knowledge that this is the Bible truth and we need it. We cannot be surface readers. Pour out your word upon us, we pray. In Christ's name. Look with me, Isaiah what chapter, friends? And the reason why this point is so important, because when I look back at my life, when I just got baptized, I wondered, was I going to grow? We all have to grow, friends. We all have to grow. And that third step called knowledge, we have to grow. It is the Bible truth. If the truth be told, the majority of you and the majority of those who profess to be Christians are not growing in the knowledge of Christ, not getting into deep Bible studies. We are just surface readers. Well, surface readers are not on the third step of the ladder of salvation. It is knowledge. Read verse 9 with me. Isaiah chapter 28. I got some bread from heaven. Watch this. Isaiah what chapter, friends? 28 verse number 9 says, Whom shall he teach what? knowledge and what whom shall he make to understand uh, doctrine them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the what the breast so this knowledge is also called doctrine this knowledge it is for those who are weaned from the milk those who are drawn from the breast that third step on the ladder of salvation points to people who are no longer babes in christ they are no longer on milk. They are take, taking in the knowledge of doctrine, of deep Bible truth. All right. And God showed me now, in contrast with the milk, babies drink milk. When, but when babies grow, no longer milk, they need what? They need strong food. They need meat. And the Bible calls this milk, the opposite, it is called honey. Called what, friends? Honey. That third step, knowledge, deep Bible truth, it's called the honey of God's word. Look with me at Proverbs 24. Where are we going to, friends? Proverbs chapter 24. Examine yourself now, friends. Some of you who were once baptized, are you growing? Are you having deep Bible studies daily? Ah, friends. I had to cry out for it. Lord, you got to take me deeper. If I am going to stand before your people humbly because you have entrusted this work to me, you have to take me deeper in your words. Deeper yet. Deeper yet. Ah, friends. And God has called all of us to be his messengers. You must also cry out for knowledge, deeper understanding of his word. Proverbs 24 says, this knowledge is likened unto honey. Are we there, friends? Tell me now, can babies drink milk? Yes, but do doctors say it's okay to give babies honey? No, but when the babies get older, can they now take a little honey? Honey is good. Look with me. Proverbs 24, verse 13, are we there? It says, my son, eat thou honey. Why? Because it is good, and the honeycomb, which is sweet, 
to thy taste, so shall what? The knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. So this knowledge on the third step of the ladder of salvation, it is likened unto honey. Not milk, friends. Milk are for babies, but it is honey. Write down in your notebook, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew what chapter? Matthew chapter 3, verse number 4 says, and verse number 5, Bible says that John the Baptist's meat, M-E-A-T, John the Baptist's food, his meat was honey. Wild locust, what locust and wild honey. The honey represents the meat of the word. That knowledge, it is not milk of the word. It is present truth. I said, now, Lord, you have wet my appetite now. So what is this knowledge that is the meat of the word? The honey, he says, it is prophecy. What? Look with me, Proverbs chapter 2. Where are we going to, my friends? Proverbs chapter 2. Because I'm hearing people say, I don't need to hear prophecy. So those who detest, those who reject the true understanding, interpretation, of Bible prophecies, they are not on the third step of the ladder, namely knowledge, knowledge, doctrine, knowledge, prophecy, knowledge, honey. And in chapter 10 of the Revelation, God gave to John and to us that little book that was sweet in his mouth as uh, honey. What is in that little book? End time prophecies. Look at Proverbs chapter 2 with me. So now you want to pass that. Why you always talk about prophecy? Because God is putting me on the third step of that ladder. And God wants all of you to be on the third step of the ladder of salvation. I want to remain there and keep walking upward. How about you? Proverbs chapter 2. Verse number 10. If you're there, say amen. It says, uh, watch, we, we just read about knowledge in Proverbs 2, verse uh, 3 through verse 6. Verse number 10 says, when wisdom enters into thine heart, and knowledge is what, friends, is pleasant unto thy soul. The Bible tells me that this knowledge will keep me from the strange woman. The strange who? And what is a woman a symbol of in prophecy? Huh. So now, so this knowledge will keep me from a strange woman. But those who don't like to hear prophecies based on scripture, they will be in league with that strange woman. I don't want to commit fornication, friends. I don't want to commit adultery, friends, with Christ. Look with me at verse number 16 now. This knowledge, it says in verse 16, to deliver thee from the strange who? From the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth what? So this woman, she forgets the covenant of her God. And Deuteronomy, write this down, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 13 says, God's covenant is the Ten Commandments. So which strange woman is forgetting God's Ten Commandments? Don't say it yet. Just listen. Skip on down to verse 18. It's the third step on the ladder of salvation. Verse 18 says, This strange woman, for her house inclines where? Inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None. How many? None. Underscore that. None. That go unto her, return again. Neither take they hold of the paths of life, that thou mayst walk in what? In the way of good men. I said, Lord, I see it. I want this knowledge to stay clear of this strange woman. I said, Lord, I don't understand what that word strange mean. Why this adjective, strange woman? And friends, I looked that word up. You would not believe me, but you, you will believe me, right? Yeah. It's God's word, right? That word strange means a person who commits adultery. Okay. Write down this number beside verse 16. Number 2114. 21, 
14. 2,114. Go back to your Strong's Concordance. This is the strange woman, one who commits adultery. She is a harlot. And where does her path lead? To death. And none who go that direction will ever be saved. That's the knowledge, the third step on the ladder of salvation. Look with me now at Proverbs chapter 7. Christ took me deeper. Proverbs chapter 7 shows me that same strange woman. And what does the word strange mean? One who commits what? Adultery. It's a harlot. She is an adulteress. Verse number 10, are we there? It says, and behold, there met him a what? A woman with the attire of what? And harlot, go to verse 25. Proverbs 7, it says, Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her path. Why? For she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. How many scripture accounts can you talk about right now where, this, where there was a harlot that slew and persecuted God's chosen messengers. How many? Give me one. Old Testament, give me one. Delilah, who caused Samson. Well, we know he gave in. All right. Who else? Jezebel. Was she a harlot? All right. Who else? Come on. New Testament now. New Testament, John the Baptist, come on. New Testament, John the Baptist, come on. Herodias, was she a harlot? Do you see it, friends? Marrying Philip and also Herod. So now, which church in the last days is called a harlot? And it's also a church that has persecuted God's people, none other than Roman Catholicism. This is the papacy. This is popery. And this is knowledge. Ah, oh, friends, do you see it now? The third step on that ladder of salvation, those who are on this ladder heading towards salvation, they stay clear of this woman. Hold your place in chapter 7 of Proverbs. Let's go. The 17th chapter of the Revelation. Go there with me, friend. This is the third step on the ladder of salvation. So those who say, I don't want to hear about uh, popery and how popery is making steps to regain world dominance, you are not on that third step of the ladder of salvation. And it's a possibility you are not even on the ladder of salvation. Because that third step is called knowledge. Proverbs 2 says, this knowledge keeps you from the strange woman. Amen. This strange woman that kills and murders God's saints. This strange woman whose paths, her ways leads to death. Stay clear. This is why it is sad, my friends. When professed Seventh-day Adventists are now preaching, we are no longer anti-Roman Catholic. What's going on, friends? They are leading people to follow the ways of the harlot. So they are not on the third step of the ladder of salvation. Oh, how could it be when Seventh-day Adventists are inviting Roman Catholic priests to speak at Seventh-day Adventist churches. What's going on, friends? They are not on the third step of the ladder of salvation. On that third step, they stay clear of the strange. Are these my words, friends? Look, it, here it is. How is it that we are allowing the words and statements from Roman Catholic monks? Roman Catholic monks, Leslie J. Hoppe, these, these writings to be placed in the Sabbath school lesson guide. What's going on, friends? These people are not on the third step of that ladder. Knowledge. Look, it's, here he is, friends. Watch. This is, uh, how, how could it be, a professed leader with an Adventism who is now saying that the Antichrist, thank you, the Antichrist is not, has nothing to do with uh, popery. What's going on here, friends? 
This is a sign. These men are not on the third step of the ladder of salvation. And if they're not on the third, they could not be on the fourth not the fifth it's a possibility they are not even on that first step because the first step on that ladder is for you to see your need watch the pope the pope is now making steps to regain word dominance my friends look at this i was shocked when i saw this this is december 27th 2015 it's all listen listen it says pope speaking we know what Jesus did on that occasion. Instead of returning home with his family, Jesus stayed in Jerusalem in the temple, causing great distress to Mary and Joseph, who were unable to find him. For this little escapade, the Pope said, Jesus probably had to beg forgiveness of his parents if you are begging forgiveness what does that imply for this little escapade Jesus probably had to beg forgiveness of his parents watch this the gospel doesn't say this but I believe that we can presume it what is he doing here friends he's adding to God's word. Do you see how intelligent you all are? And what does the Bible say in the 22nd chapter of the Revelation and verse number 18? If you add unto God's word, what will God do unto you? He will add unto you the seven last plagues. He will add unto you the plagues in this book. Also friends, what, is, what will be his fate? Ah, oh, friends, can we see what's going on in Luke chapter 2? Did Christ have to beg forgiveness of Mary? What is the Pope setting up here? That the world must turn and ask forgiveness from whom? Let me leave that for the future. Do you see how deceptive he is, friends? But true knowledge keep us from the strange woman. So those who don't want to hear this, will follow the ways of that strange woman and that way leads to where death but in luke chapter 2 verse 40 verse 41 when mary asked christ where were you what did christ say <laughs> wonderful no it's not why were you looking for me i was where my father said i should be but where were you you were busy talking with the people in the crowd and you misplace me then christ says what know you not i must be about my father's business so was christ doing his father's business a sin what is he now saying friends you haven't heard anything yet steps are being put in place to bring about the re-emerging of popery in the last days look at what have you forgotten this friends have you forgotten this? Uh, Arizona Senator says, uh, church attendance should be what? Mandatory. Mandatory. It says, just skip on down. I don't have much time. It says, probably. We should be debating a what? A bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday. To stem moral corruption. Have you forgotten this? I hope not. Because look at this. December 25th, 2015, Pittsburgh Post Gazette. What is the headline here? Sunday traditions. It says, Our Congress should revisit and our candidates for president should consider what? advocating the restoration of Sunday as a day of rest a paid day of rest a required day of rest is that not an implication of Sunday worship by law a Sunday law look here friend it says watch it says here we need to restore one take away from our past Sunday as a day of rest a day of 
worship, a day of prayer that was invaluable to our family values and individual well-being. Our steps now being taken for the enforcing of that Sunday law crisis. Look here, friends. All in December, December 15th, 2015. How many of you love Christmas? <laughs> I hope not. Look here, friends. This is another politician. Three in a row. Look here, friends. War on Christmas. It says, uh, House Republicans introduced bill to protect what? Holiday. What holiday? It says, uh, now therefore be it resolved. Yahoo News. Be it resolved that the House of Representatives recognizes the importance of the symbols and traditions of Christmas. Number two, that we strongly disapprove of attempts to ban references to Christmas. It is a message our country and the world needs now. What is it? What are they saying, friends? Let us have a law to protect what? To protect Christmas. But question, friend, where did Christmas come from? Paganism. Paganism. Christmas means what? Christ in the Mass. You're not hearing me. It's a Roman Catholic annual holiday from Rome. There it is, friends. Let's move on. It says here, watch. It says, uh, Pope Francis, August 17, 2015. He says, uh, the Eucharist is what? Is Jesus Christ. So when they say Christmas is our ho holy day, one of our holy days, our annual holy day, the word Christmas really means Christ in the Mass, which means that the Pope claims and the priest claim that they actually create Jesus Christ on the communion table. So when a person honors and celebrates Christmas, they are also saying, we believe the Pope and priest can create Jesus Christ in the bread and the grape juice. Well, they drink liquor. Listen what this says. It says, uh, Eucharist. Wow, skip on down. The Pope says, uh, on Sunday, the Pope said that the Eucharist is no mere symbol, but it is what? In fact, the true body and what? Blood of Jesus Christ. So now, when the, when the lawmakers are saying, let's have now, watch, a law to protect Christmas and to strongly disapprove anybody from preaching against Christmas. What is coming? Can you not see what's coming, friends? Because Christmas, Christ in the Mass, is their annual holy day. But Popery has a weekly holy day, so-called. What is it? So is there, is there a time coming then when laws are going to be passed that you cannot preach against Sunday worship? Yes. It's coming. Listen what the Lord's messenger says. How did Sister White know this? That this would take place, she says, with you and Herod. She says, uh, what friends? Roman Catholic principles. That's plural. Roman Catholic principles will be taken under what? The care and protection of the state. Is that going on now? What will happen next? She says, uh, this national apostasy will speedily be followed by national ruin. The protest of Bible truth will be no longer tolerated by those who have not made the law of God their rule of life. One more statement. It says here, GC 581, let the principle once be established in the United States that what, friends? The church may employ or control the power of the state, that religious what? Is Christ in the mass, a so-called religious observance. That religious observances may be enforced by what? Secular laws. In short, that the authority of church and state is to dominate the conscience and what now? Come on, let's read. And the triumph 
of Rome in this country will be a it is certain to take place. Are we here, my friends? And do you know what's going on even right now in the Midwest, even in the South here? Calamities. What, friends? These are calamities. Look here. This is 17 million people facing flood threat as Missouri rivers reach, what, friends? Record high level. And all of these calamities began when? During, during what so-called holiday? Christmas. And what is Christmas to them? An annual holy day. Don't forget that. It's getting worse, my friends. I was shocked when I saw this. Dozens of states are suffering and nations over what? The Christmas holiday. Even in Britain, in areas around Paraguay and Uruguay and Brazil and Argentina, all around which holiday? Christ in the Mass. Why during Christmas? Why during Christmas? And they say, December 31st, 2015, it says, biggest El Nino effects on the U.S. may what? May be yet to come. In other words, the calamities are going to get worse. And they will say, look, the calamities came on December 25th, our holy day. That means uh, Christmas is a holy day. We must enforce it uh, as a holy day, forcing people to keep Christmas. Oh boy. And having a law, you can preach against Christmas. Christ in the mass. What's coming, friends? Do you know how many reformers died during the dark ages, were martyred because they preach against Christ in the mass? You think I'm crazy, right? You can't see what's coming, friends. Look, it says, uh, GC 575 says, uh, watch, it says, uh, later the Pope gave what? Directions that the parish priest should admonish the violators of Sunday, the weekly holy day, right? as Christ in the Mass, Christmas, the annual Holy Day, and wish them to go to church and say their prayers, lest they bring some great calamity on themselves and neighbors. A church council brought forward the argument, since so widely employed, even by Protestants, let's read now, that because persons had been struck by lightning while laboring on Sunday, it must be the... Sabbath. So what would they now say? All these historic calamities took place on Christmas. It must be a what? A holy day. My friends, is probation about to close? And my question is, Father in heaven, grab hold of our minds. Because the majority of us aren't even on the ladder of salvation. It's time for us to examine ourselves are we on that ladder? Do we have that faith as yet? It's a gift. Do we have the virtue, which is a gift? So we can then add to virtue knowledge. Help us, dear God. In Christ's name we pray. Look with me at John chapter 17. Where are we going to, friends? So what does the Lord say through Peter? Add to your faith what? Virtue. And to virtue what? Knowledge. And to knowledge what? We're not there yet. So on the third step, namely knowledge. So what knowledge, hear me, what knowledge does Christ want to give to us? What knowledge, friends? What is that knowledge? It is the Bible. True. Hear me now. It is deep what, friends? It's prophecy. Deep Bible truth. But question, just the mere understanding of the Bible truth I saw couldn't save me. And you just knowing prophecy and doctrines, that would not save you. Because Christ showed me in John chapter 5, verse number 39 and verse number 40, Christ says, search you the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me, but you will not come. So if you come to me, I will give you eternal life. So God had to awaken my mind just to mere understanding 
of Bible prophecies and doctrines will not save you, Andrew. You need the knowledge also of conversion. So what is God saying to you, friends? Just knowing what's coming won't save you. You need the knowledge of conversion. Would you say amen? Oh boy. Would you say amen? And what says John 17 verse 3 now? What knowledge do we need? John 17 3. And this is life eternal. Let's read that. That they might know thee. That's knowledge. The only true God. And Jesus Christ whom thou has sent. So what knowledge does Christ want to give to us? The knowledge of knowing him. The knowledge of receiving eternal life. When I read that scripture, God showed me, but you're still living in sin. And no man who holds on to cherished sin can be saved. And I'm telling you, look at me, look at me carefully. If you hold on to any known sin, you will not be saved, my friends. That means our body temples must be cleansed. And God is telling us we can never cleanse ourselves. The knowledge of salvation. How many of you remember the sanctuary message? Do you know what God showed me? It was he who gave the men the knowledge to build that sanctuary. Exodus 31. They could not build the sanctuary, even though they had the blueprint. You're not hearing me, friends. That God gave Moses a blueprint of the sanctuary. You need to hear me. But just the knowledge of that blueprint was not enough, my brother. God had to give them now extra, more knowledge to now put the blueprint, the theory into practice. You're not hearing me. You're not hearing me. So now what sanctuary does God want me to build? What sanctuary does God want you to build? Our body temples. Our temples must be the place for what? The Holy Ghost to dwell in. So now what knowledge do we need? The knowledge of conversion to put now this theory into practice. Well, listen. Naturally, we don't see our need. Naturally, we are lukewarm Laodiceans. Naturally, we think that we are okay. Is that not the truth, my friends? Naturally, we all think that we are okay. But what does God say to lukewarm Laodiceans? Because you sayest that you are rich and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not. Come on, friends, what are those two words? And knowest not. Talk to me now, talk to me now, friends. Let me show you what God showed me. So, you see it? So does lukewarm lady see us lack something? What do they lack? Knowledge. Go there with me. Chapter 3 of the Revelation. So what do lukewarm Laodiceans lack? They lack knowledge. And what is the third step on the ladder of salvation? It is knowledge. Knowledge. That means if I think that I am okay, I am not on that third step of the ladder of salvation. And if you think that you are okay, you are not on that third step of that ladder of salvation, namely knowledge. And we think that we are okay. Let's read that, friends. Are we there? Verse number 17 together, what it says. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Help us, Holy Spirit. And knowest not that thou art what? Wretched, miserable, poor. What is that next word? Blind and what? And naked. So now, Christ is saying in verse number 17, if we are going to receive the knowledge of salvation, the knowledge of conversion, Andrew, you must first see your need. Mm -hmm. If you are going to receive 
his knowledge of salvation, of conversion, you must first see your need. Is that clear? No, no, is that clear? Do you see it, friends? And as I began to examine myself right here, Christ says, you are wretched, Andrew, miserable, you are poor, blind, and naked. I looked at that fourth point, you are blind. And my mind went to the blind man in John chapter 9. Listen, and what God is saying, if you just sincerely acknowledge and confess that you are blind spiritually, I can do for you, Andrew, what I did for that blind man in John chapter 9. Because if you remain blind, you're going to be lost. And Christ showed me an account. When he, the blind man, there were some people who say, Master, we're not blind. And Christ said, if you say you're not blind, if you say that you see, that means your sins remain with you. Hmm. Lord, I'm blind. What do you say? You're not hearing me. Christ says, if you say you're not blind, if you say that you see, your sins remain on you. Lord, I am blind. What do you say? All right. So now do we see our need then? Praise God. God brought us here now. You see, friends? The Holy Ghost is working. I'm excited for what God is going to share with us now. God has brought us here now. We see our need. It makes no sense we say that we can see. No, we are blind. So what did God do for that blind man in John 9? Did God restore his sight? And how did God restore his sight? What did Christ do for him? It says Christ took some clay, right? Why clay? Why dust? And Christ spat and used that spittle on that clay and what? And anointed his eyes and told him, go and wash just pause right there. Just pause right there. Go and do what? Go wash in the pool of Salom. What is today? The Sabbath. It's communion service, right? And before we partake of that unleavened bread and that uh, unfermented grape juice, what must we first do? Go and wash. All right. All right. Are oh, you seeing it now, friend? So it makes no sense if I say I don't need washing. Because if I say I am okay, my sins remain. I need washing. How about you? Go and wash. I said, Lord, why clay and why spit? Why clay and spit? Why, Lord? God is showing me that scene in John chapter 9. It's a repetition of creation. Go to John chapter 9 with me. It's a what, friends? It's a repetition of creation. It is recreation. God formed man out of the clay, the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils, breath of life. And what? Man became what? A living soul. When God made Adam, could he see? Yes, he could see. John chapter 9, are we there, my friends? And the Bible says, Christ told him, go and wash. And as he began to speak, the blind man who was now seeing, he said, Christ played, placed clay on my eyes and anointed my eyes. That spittle represents an anointing. And who does Christ send to anoint us? The Holy Spirit. You're not hearing me. That means, that means, that means recreation. The prayer of David must be my prayer. Psalm 51. The prayer of David must be your prayer. And what did David pray in Psalm 51 verse 10? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not what? And take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. 
But God showed me David could not pray that prayer, hear me, until David saw his need, that he was undone, in need of restoration, in need of maintaining, receiving, and maintaining the Holy Spirit, the anointing. Do you see your need today? John chapter 9, are we there, my friends? Beloved, look here at verse number 9. Pardon me, verse number 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he did what? He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Recreation, verse 7, go wash. And the man came seeing. Verse number 8 now, friends. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Verse number 8, verse number 9, it says, when the people saw the man who was now seeing, they could not believe their eyes. They said, is that the man who was once blind? Hear me. They said, is that the man who was once begging? Wait a minute. If he was blind and begging, why was he begging? He was what? He was poor. <laughs> and what is the condition of lukewarm later scenes? They are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind. Verse number 8, it says, uh, The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. I have been changed. Beloved, to God, Christ, he wants to give us an experience, a change in our lives, that when people see us, they can't even believe. Is that, is that Andrew? Is he who, who was once poor in spirit? Wait a minute. So he was once poor in spirit, and because he saw his need, Christ fulfilled what he lacked. How many of us feel poor in spirit many times? Ah, oh, friends. But can Christ make you rich in faith? And what is faith? What step on the ladder is faith? The first step, praise God. And add to your faith what now? And what is virtue? Power, valor, courage to fight the battles of life. Can Christ do it for us? Listen now, is this he? And verse number 9, verse number 10, the people said, Since Christ has done that for you, I want to meet him. I want to meet that Jesus. So when Christ gives us an experience, one of conversion, it, it is for the purpose that souls, when they see you and hear you, will want that same experience. Verse number 10, are we there, friends? Let's read verse 10, what it says. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes open? What's the first word in the question? You better talk to me. Now, so why did they say how? Did they say who? Did they say what? What did they ask him? Ah. So why did they say how? They wanted to find out what steps you took. What steps did you take to get converted? Because that same man, we have seen him before around town. We have seen him around town. But how did you get converted? And this is what the world is waiting on, friends. This is what the world is waiting on. They want to see the steps you took to bring you to this point. Because they knew you. They knew when you were once in the world. And now you are here talking about present truth. Talking about seven-day Adventism. How did you get from there to here? Friends, so not just with the Bible, they want scripture and the house. And that's what the world needs. This gospel must be preached as a witness. Skip on down. Are you seeing this, my friends? 
So when we partake later on of the foot washing and the bread and the grape juice, these are practical things to have Christ within. People want to know the house in your life. Verse number 10 says, skip on down to verse 11. He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus. It seems to me he did not even fully understand Jesus. Oh, friends. Did he ever see him before? No. Because once Christ gave him the, the ice salve and sent him to wash, he did not meet Christ again at this point. So could it be? Here's the encouragement. I don't have to know everything before I can experience Christ. Wow. Could it be that you don't have to wait to know all truths in the Bible, all doctrines that even now you can experience Christ and become converted? That is hope. Do you know why my face is all made up? Because I know many preachers, they say you have to know all these doctrines and when you listen to them, there's no conversion in it. There's no hows in it. No how to do. No how to do. Friends, let me tell you something. When I get to heaven, I'll learn everything. And guess what? We'll be studying throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. We just need to focus on what is important. Those three angels' messages. Along with conversion, the house, skip on down. It says in verse 11, a man that is called Jesus made clay and what? And said, go wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Look at verse 12 now. Then say they unto him what? Where is he? Wait a minute, friends. Now, what's going on here? Did they ask who or where he was first? No. Oh, beloved, somebody's going to get it. Help us, Holy Ghost. The first question they asked when they saw his conversion was how? And once he gave his testimony, then they said, where is he? We want to show people where Christ is first before we tell them what he has done for us. That's it. And when they see the house in your life, when they see what Christ has done for you, then they will ask you, where is he? <laughs> 2016 is the year for what? Aggressive evangelism, friends. And guess what day this was? When Christ did this for this man. He was now converted. And the day in which the people asked, the how and where is he? It was on the Sabbath day. Verse number 14 confirms that. What day is today? So what can Christ do for me today? What can Christ do for you today, friends? Today. And once we see our need first, will Christ restore us? You mean only a few yes? So once we see our need, I ask again, what will Christ do for us today? On the Sabbath, will he restore us, friends? Yes. So now, now, some of us who may be at the back of the line, as you begin to see others who have begun to receive conversion, what question must you ask? For uh, You see, you're with me. The Holy Ghost is here. How, how, how do you come from over there in the world? To overhear with Christ. And then what must be your second question? How may I find him? Where is he? And now, if you were to ask me the question, come on, ask me. I can't tell you right now. <laughs> ask me again. Oh, friend, it would take a day. But not for him. He gave enough in 10 minutes. You're not hearing me. How? Oh, friends, it is first seeing my need. Must I go there, friends? It's first seeing my need and say, dear God, I don't have the strength to be converted. Grant me that desire every single day. That's the how. 
And Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says, It is God who worketh in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The how put your will, your choice on the side of Jesus. That's the how. Now we're, ask me the question. Rising up early in the mornings. <laughs> And spending time with Jesus. That's where I meet him. Amen. It's when that clock strikes 12 noon. That's where I meet him. And when I meet him. It's just before I go to bed at the setting of the sun. That's where and when I meet him. And all throughout the day. I'm playing scripture songs in my ears, the hymns in my ears. I'm listening to scripture words on the CD. I'm listening to the spirit of prophecy being played. That's the where and the when. The hows, my friends. This is how you maintain the experience. So now, when I'm tempted, when I'm tempted, I can say, Lord, give me strength to say yes to you. And no to this sinful desire. That's my choice. And he says, I will empower your choice. Then now listen, when I do what is right, this is right doing by faith. This is righteousness by faith. And as you experience it, you can teach it. But listen, as I close, come back to John chapter 9. There were some Pharisees who came and said, who opened your eyes? Who opened your eyes? It could not be that man called Jesus. Do you know what the blind man said who was now seeing? He said, this I know. This I what? This I know. So what step was he on? What step was he on on the ladder? Did he know something? Did he know something? He said, this I know. This I know. When you meet people and they say, is Jesus really your savior is the bible really inspired is the spirit of prophecy really inspired listen this i know Amen. this i know i was once blind now i see i was once in the world when i pray to that man jesus i receive power when I read the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, I was once blind. Now I see. Since the blind man said I was once blind, did he confess his need? Did he see his need? Did he surrender? I was once blind. Now I see. Go back to 2 Peter with me, friends. And when did he receive that, that power? When did he receive that knowledge? When did that blind man put his feet on the third step of the ladder? What day was this? The Sabbath, what day is today? Ah, oh, friends. The first step is to see your need. I am blind, I need sight. And today before you leave, you can leave saying, this I know. I was once blind. This I know, I used to love reggae music. This I know, I love it no more. By God's grace, right doing, right thinking, right singing, by faith. This I know. I was once blind, now I see. I know something. I'm on the third step of the ladder. Oh, friend, can all of us walk on that step right now? Step number, come on, put your foot down. Amen. Second Peter chapter 1, are we there, my friends? In Second Peter chapter 1, look what Christ will, will do for us. Once we add, once we see our need, add to our faith virtue, virtue knowledge, as we add, what will Christ do in verse 2? Read verse 2, what it says. Grace and peace be what? Okay, hear me now. As we add, what will Christ do? Friends, do you know how many years I've read this scripture? Listen to me. If you think you have heard anything, you haven't heard anything yet. But Pastor, you're closing. I know. It's the best part. I love to eat food. and Yeah, I love eating food. 
And when the food tastes good, I, I take my time and I savor it. And sometimes I leave that thing I like the best at the side. But not my wife. <laughs> She's the best part first. <laughs> I said, Hillary, where's the protein? <laughs> I eat that part first. Amen. Let's go to our Bible. Second Chronicles, chapter 1. Where are we going to, friends? I have left the best for last. As we add, what will Christ do? He will multiply. Years upon years, I've read that scripture. And I did not fully comprehend that there was an account in the Bible where this is seen. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue what knowledge the Lord brought me to Solomon's account. Solomon. How many of us remember Solomon? In verse number 7 of chapter 1 of 2 Chronicles. Look at me, friends. We know the story. What did God say to Solomon in verse number 7? He says, ask what I shall give thee. Hear me now, hear me now. We're closing. Did the Lord have some blessing for Solomon? And since these blessings were gifts, how was Solomon to receive it? What was he to do? Just ask. Friends, hear me. Salvation is simple. Just ask for it. But ask sincerely. That's it, my friends. The concept is simple. The principle is simple. But hear me now. Because we have gone so far in sin to come back, it's stern battle with self. That's it. But listen, the more we yield, the stronger we become. And the weaker that temptation is. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. So now, what did Solomon pray for? What did Solomon ask for? He's not only wisdom. What's that third step on the ladder? Go to verse 10. He says, give me now wisdom and uh, knowledge. Did Solomon want to take that step on the ladder of salvation? Give me knowledge. Why? He says that I may lead this great people. Hear me. Parents, parents, what do you need to lead your home? What do you need to lead your children? What do you need? What must you ask God as did Solomon? Give me what? All right. Give me wisdom. Give me knowledge. And Solomon says that I may lead this people. For who can judge this thy people? That is so what? Great. That means Solomon saw a great task ahead of him. How many of you see great tasks ahead of you? Hmm? How many of you know you have to make decisions to get ready for the mark of the beast crisis? How many of you know you have to make right decisions to make it daily through your crises? Yes. So like Solomon, what must we pray? Dear God, grant me what? Wisdom and knowledge. So now, did he ask for it? Yes. Did God give it to him? Yes. Watch this. Did Solomon see his need? Yes. What, what says that? He saw his need. By asking. If you ask for something, it's because you understand your lack. I don't have what it takes to make it. I don't have what it takes to make it. In the physical, temporal sense, in the spiritual sense. I don't have what it takes to make it, dear God. When we come to Christ this way, every day, every day, Lord, I don't have what it takes to make it today. Then we're in the right condition for him now to multiply blessings. And Christ said to Solomon, verse number 11, Since you didn't ask for riches, nor wealth, nor honor, nor even the head of your enemies, neither for long life, I'm going to multiply some things unto you. And what did God give to Solomon? The riches, the wealth, and the honor that Solomon had. He saw his need, dear God, add that wisdom and knowledge. 
And what did God do? God multiplied unto him. That's 2 Peter chapter 1. Do you see it, my friends? As you add, he multiplies. Yet how many of us pray for the head of our enemies? How many of us, our focus is just on riches, on job, on wealth, but not Solomon? He sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all, that's the multiplication now, and all these things shall be added unto you. All these things shall be added. Once you add, Christ multiplies. But you have to see your need. I don't have what it takes to make it. I don't have what it takes to make it. How many of us feel that way right now? Look at your life, friends. Look at your life. Look at your life. Look at your life. You know it. You don't have what it takes to make it. You don't know. You don't have what it takes to make it. But if you come, it's interesting, friends, that it is implied Solomon would not have gone to God. Christ sought him out. Look at the love of Jesus. In a dream, wake up, Solomon. What do you want? Ask me. In other words, if Christ doesn't come to me, I will never turn to him. He came seeking Solomon. He came seeking me. I know you feel insufficient. Stop looking out there. Turn over here. Turn to me. Just ask. Just ask. Do you see Christ's love today, friends? He's seeking you out. Because you just won't turn to him. You turn to a husband, you turn to a wife, to the children, the boss man, everything without Jesus. Just turn, to, just ask, just ask. As if Christ knows what we need. And he sees us making shipwreck of our faith and he seeks us out. Turn to me, just ask. I'll give it to you. It's a test. What will you now ask for? What will you now ask for? Dear God, give me the wisdom. Give me the knowledge. Give me what it takes to make it today. That I may glorify your name and God will add the rest. God adds the rest. How do you feel right now, friends? How do you feel right now? Do you see a need for washing? Do you see a need for starting over with Jesus? Some of you felt beaten up. And you were beaten up. When you walked inside here, you didn't even think about being on the ladder of salvation. Some of you felt as if you were way down there. But today, a ladder came down. Wow. From where, Pastor? All the way up there. And wherever you are, that ladder goes right there. Right there. Right there. Do you feel lonely? The ladder comes right there. Do you feel depressed? The ladder is right by your feet. Do you feel suicidal? The ladder is right by your feet. Do you feel as if there's no hope? The ladder is right by your feet. Do you feel lost? The ladder is right by your feet. And guess what? Angels are ascending and what? Why does it say they ascend first and then descend? God is showing us it starts by him bringing us up. They're helping us on every step, second step, third step. The angels of heaven are helping us. And then we can claim now, Jude 24, come on. Now unto? Who believes it? One more time. Now unto? That is to keep you. Wait a minute. Do you know why that is so important? Many times I've made a step with Christ and felt this would not last. I'm going to fall. And by me thinking doubtfully, I fell. And some of you have and are thinking the very same thing. But pastor, I'm going to fall. No, 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 no. You don't have to fall. 
It's your choice. Hear me, hear me, hear me. And he will empower your choice. And look at me. Look at Jesus. If he's doing it through me, he can do it through you. Come on now. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his throne with what? Exceeding what, friends? Joy. Pause right there. So on the third step, do we have to go back down? Father in heaven, Father in heaven, who today say, Lord, I see a need for my feet, my body to be washed, my soul to be washed when I raise your hand right now. You see your need, the body to be washed, feet to be washed, the whole soul, the mind to be washed. Hands down. You see your need today. You say, Lord, I need that virtue. I need that valor. I need that power to fight courageously for you daily. When I raise your hand. Lord, give me that knowledge of salvation. And Lord, use it as I add, you will multiply. Who now today say, Lord, I want, I want, I want the assurance of salvation today. Why not raise your hand, friends? Hands down, hands down. Even those online, Safety Serve International, let's all kneel. Let's all kneel. Father in heaven.